All right, this is a big one today, guys. D. Snyder is back on the show for round two, and this time we got him for an hour. He's got a new book coming out called Frats, and it's a very entertaining read about fraternities and high schools in New York. It's based on true events. It's a great story. So we're going to discuss the frat culture and how that has now been lumped into toxic masculinity and cancel culture. We're also going to discuss how people tried to cancel D for being transphobic. His thoughts on that, all the division in this country, all this and so much more coming right up. Welcome back. By the way, you did my show a couple of years ago, I think, and it was a lot of fun. So hopefully this will be fun too. And um, yeah, you've got a new book out, Frats. I just finished it today. Great stuff. And it's funny because I, I'm actually not usually a fan of fiction. I just have a hard time focusing. But this one, I was like, oh, this is an easy read. Like, it's really easy to get uh, wrapped up with the characters and the story. And uh, it did it do a good job of keeping the action. There's never like a lot of lulls or anything. Thank you. Uh, and, uh, you know, part, but for your money, it, there's so much truth in it, so much uh, nonfiction. Like, as it says on the front cover, it says uh, based on actual events. So, all the stories, all the action, all the issues, virtually all, are uh, are things that happened. Not all just to one person. There are an amalgam of events that happened over the course of the years I was in high school observing the uh, the frats phenomenon. Um, and then other things like, you know, the romance, uh, Bobby's romance with Angel. Well, it bears a very striking similarity to events that happened uh, uh, with me and my wife, uh, the mafia princess uh, with the death threats, the long walk on a snowy night and all those. So I tried, and even the location, Baldwin is where I grew up. So geographically, it is note for note, step for step, real. And I, and I really borrowed that from uh, Stephen King, who many of his stories or books are set in Maine because he's from Maine, he knows Maine, and it's just a it's a it's a real place, and it speaks to truth when he's talking about the roads and the and the different areas and the environment. So try to capture. So there's a lot of uh, nonfiction in this fiction book. That makes sense. That's probably why I'm more interested in just that time frame. And that was I, I'm child of the '80s, but still the '70s is kind of the '60s and '70s is an interesting time as well. So, um, so tell me about yeah the frats. So this was this was a real thing. There was high school. Frats, is this only in New York or was this all over the country? Well, that's why I wrote the story because I assumed because it was the world I grew up in from elementary school into junior high and then into high school and into the the the, uh, the minefield of high school um, that this was just the way of the world. Um, it was in the town next door and the town there, all the bordering towns had fraternities. So it was just a reality. It wasn't until I started traveling and talking to people and, you know, and all that downtime and rock and roll and conversations, you start talking about high school. And I mentioned the frats, high school frats, and to a man and woman, they go, what's that? He said, you mean like college? I'm like, no, 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 high school fraternities. Nobody had those. And the idea that because they had charters like college fraternities, because but with the police, at least you had to register your fraternity because they had Fraternity, fraternal colors and jackets and t-shirts and somehow that made them not gangs which is what they were and the school gave them such latitude and as you saw in the book it was reflected in the parents attitude oh let boys be boys hun i remember getting hazed when i was a kid you know but this was not college these weren't young these weren't adults these were really kids you know just post pubescent kids running around and acting like they were adults when in fact they didn't have the, I don't know, they didn't have the mental uh, capabilities of really handling these things. Right. Yeah. Cause I think that's, what's different from the college frats. I mean, I don't know. I've never been in any sort of frat, but I would assume from what I've seen on movies and TV, the college frats, there's not as many fights. Whereas the, in this book, the high school frats, it was much more about like fights. I mean, yeah, they had the drinking and stuff and the hazing too, but there's a lot of like uh violent. I mean, you're right. It's like glorified gangs. You know what, and, and that's a, that's a great observation. Uh, what is the difference between a college frat and a high school frat? Well, a college frat, I mean, these guys are in their in their you know late teens, twenties. So you're as you know, with every year you get a little more more 
in control. Not saying that they're totally in control, but a little more adult like. Uh, and these kids, these these you know, 15, 14, 15, 16 year olds, 17 year olds, all living at home. And the college frats, yeah, partying, hazing, yeah. But you don't hear about the rumbles. And this was very 19, even not the 50s, it's 70s, but 1950s style rumbling fights. You know, uh, you know, you know, as in the book, you know, we're gonna have a, a rumble, picking a place. You don't hear about that in college. I guess they're too drunk. But uh, but the, but the high school brats, it seemed to be more about that than anything else. Yeah, that's interesting. My dad uh, grew up in the, I guess he was born in 45. So he would have been in high school. What well, that would have been like the early 60s. Yeah. And he said there was fights every day after school. Like, I mean, I don't think they had the frats or whatever, but this was like Tacoma, Washington. He said there was fights every day after school and kids would fight, but then they would, then the fight would be over. And then the problems would kind of resolve a lot of times. And then they would, people would move on. Yeah, well, you know, and and that's it. People have commented about uh, fights and fighting, and that it used it used to be. God, this is an old old dude thing here, but it definitely that's right. It used to be more like punches, you know, and kicks, and 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 then it's over. And now you're hearing, you know, about shootings and gun violence, and there seems to be more retribution going on and more retaliation and. You know, and knives and bats and weapons. It's not, it's not like you and me, man, in the back, you know, at the meet me at the flag post at three o'clock and we're gonna duke it out. You know, it sounds kind of stupid now, but it was <laughs> more it was more innocent. Yeah. If, if if and and but what you were seeing in the early 70s already and reflects my book, that innocence was starting to leave, you know, and you were starting to see weapons coming in, and you were starting to see dirty fighting and 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 revenge and and payback and you know all that kind of stuff that changed the whole tone of the you know meet me after school where you know you know meet me meet me after school thing that your dad talked about yeah i mean you said some i heard you say something in an interview about how some of the reviews are saying uh, toxic mas masculinity which is just for some reason that phrase bothers me because i, I don't know i feel like uh being masculine is not a problem but I do think there's being assholes. I feel like the people in the book are just, they're assholes. Like the one guy you talk about, uh, Jimmy O, kind of the villain. Um, I mean, you say that he's just pure, pure downright evil and is more than just uh, being a jerk or whatever. Yeah, well, I mean, and, you know, and I don't want to give away uh, any punchlines, but the what he, what you know, that he's um, uh, Bobby speaks about uh, Jimmy O after the fact and that, and what he did um, Jimmy O is a fictitious character, but a member of that particular fraternity did that thing that I talked about, uh, that brutal, and he went to prison for life. Uh, so so the, he was a psychotic, he was based on very psychotic characters that really existed. Um, you know, that toxic masculinity thing, that shocked me, uh, because it was the publishers, they're going, my God, we love this book. It's about toxic masculinity. I'm like, what? I'm like, you know, I wasn't, I was just writing about a world that I was steeped in. And by steeped, I don't mean I was in the France. I don't believe I was one of those guys swinging a bat. I mean, I was one of those guys trying not to get his ass kicked for a good part of my life. You know, I'm this big, weird dude with hair and platform. Like, I was just, I was a target. I was a target. So like, I, you know, I mean, so, but I was a, a, you know, and you read the book, just so you know where I fit in. I'm one of the Bretts. Okay. The Bretts, for people who are reading it, the Bretts are sort of these nerds uh, have a lunch table that take Bobby in and uh, and they sort of fill him in on the world, uh, the fraternal world. And I was one of, we weren't called the Bretts, but me and uh, Don Fury and Ray, we used to sit there and we were great observers as music, musicians and geeks. We were observers of this crazy paternal world that we were just staying out of the way of, but it's still also in awe and amazement of how intense it was. And how, you know, and also for some reason, those people were viewed as the cool guys, you know, uh, with the, the frat jackets and getting in the fights and all that kind of stuff. So um, yeah, the whole idea of, of, of yeah, I, I hate the, uh, in, you know, a cancel culture. I hate the term, you know, toxic masculinity. I hate all these terms. Yeah, you know, it was pretty toxic, and it and it <laughs> and it definitely brewed some psychopaths. You know, there's a lot of people came out come out of that 
um, environment and they are worse for it. And other of us learn from it. And um, and for me, it made me not stronger in the sense of it made me tougher because I had to, you know, uh, insulate myself or protect myself in this environment. And I'm not saying I was constantly getting in fights with things like that. That was like kind of the worst thing you do. But you still you either sort of just folded up and crawled into the fetal position, or you just sort of said, "All right, I got to get through this." commons area one way or the other and i'm going to get make it through there and you just sort of learn how to handle yourself in these situations and life is filled with these situations well yeah and it's just interesting because when you look at this i mean you see how our world has changed even in our lifetimes like back in the 70s like that's how it was there was fights and then one of the in chapter two you talk about the insensitive comments and jokes that people make i mean we have come so far away from that which okay, there's probably some good to that too, but do you think that we've gone too far that, I mean, you can't make fun of anything anymore. I mean, comedians have, I interview a lot of comedians. I mean, they have the toughest job in the world right now trying to make fun of things, but not get in trouble for it. Yeah. I go to a lot of comedy shows. I, mean, I live in LA and, you know, and the uh, way a lot of them handle, handle it is, 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 you know, F you, I'm going to say this, you know, <laughs> F you, I'm going to say this, <laughs> F you people, I'm going to yeah. say this, you know, um, you know, yeah, we are worse for it because, I remember incredibly, endlessly insensitive comments, racist comments about everybody, everybody. I mean, you know, ethnicities, religions, it would, but it was all on the table. It was kind of like a, a Mel Brooks movie, you know, where he's kind of like, you know, like Blazing Saddles, where you watch it and he's making fun of everybody. There's nobody, you know, he's making fun of rape and and, and blacks and Jews and in Native American. He's just going full. And that's what makes it funny, uh, be, it makes it acceptable to me, because it's not targeting one group and it's not anger or hostility. And it wasn't. And, and, and with me and my friends, it wasn't uh, when we were telling these, you know, the Italian jokes, Polish jokes, Jew jokes, black jokes, whatever it was, it wasn't like. What any militia said, it was just funny. And everybody told them and everybody laughed. But all of a sudden it became, you can't say that about my people. You can't say that about my people. And just, I want to say, Howard Stern once, I was listening and, and it was brilliant. A woman called up and uh, I won't bother doing her, her Long Island accent. But she said, Howard, I listen, I'm a long time listener. I love your show. I think you're the funniest person, but you crossed the line today when you spoke about X. And Howard said, let me get this straight. I make fun of everybody. And you laughed. You've been laughing for years. But the minute I touch on a subject that is clo too close to home for you, that's not funny. He said, lady, I'd rather have you call me up and say, I don't think anything you do is funny because at least you are sincere in your commitment to being against. But to sit there and, and, and handpick what's going to offend you and what's not going to offend you, you're an asshole. You know, you're you're just, you're just an asshole, right? You know, and and that's that's it. People, this this hypersensitivity seem to be more not you know, people saying, you know, none of this is cool. It seems to be more people saying, well, I object to that, and I object to that, and I'm Native American, and I'm trans, and I'm you know, and I'm black, and I'm Jewish, you know, you know, and objecting to individual things because they touch home, and uh, you know, it's like like Howard said, either. You're against any kind of uh, a thing like that, or you, it's, you accept that it's all, you know, funny, at least in a comedic sense, in a non-malicious sense, because like you said, comedians are having a hell of a time now. Exactly. Yeah. No, it's, it's got to be hard to not piss people off. And maybe for some of them, that's what they want to do is piss people off. Well, yeah. I mean, you certainly have those guys. I mean, it's the old Don Rickles. Anybody remembers him? His thing was just insult yes. the audience. He's hilarious. Yeah, and, and, and I can't and, imagine him in today's world though. It wouldn't work. I know. His thing was just insult the audience, top to bottom, and then at the end, you go, you know, he come, he, he would get all. He, he says, "I never pick on the little guy. I only pick on the big guys, and it's all in good fun." And every, and everybody, you paid to go see it, and it was a fair chance he was going to aim at you. It was a fair chance. But you know, I, that, right? Could it could it happen today? Could blazing saddles happen today with all the N word jokes in there, and the Jew jokes, and the Native jokes, and the rape jokes, rape jokes? In, in, you know, uh, it, but how could that movie even be made today? Doubtful. 
No, no, no. I mean, I'm trying to think of the last good comedy that was made. There hasn't been a really, I mean, like the hangover was like 2010 or something. Like a lot of those movies haven't been made in the last 10 years. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, it, it, it is, it's, it's just, uh, it's crazy to think that, that some, and that's, and Blazing Saddles is one of the great comedies. I remember seeing it on 42nd street before 42nd street became like a nice place to go. And I lived in Manhattan in the seventies, in the, in the Serpico seventies. And me and my buddy went to see Blazing Saddles and, um, you know, 42nd street. I mean, it was a large uh, urban pop, uh, you know, people, uh, African-American people in there trying to find the acceptable word. And uh, I was rolling, laughing, and my friend was freaking out. He going, dude, calm down, calm down. We're going to get our asses kicked. Because there was a lot of black jokes in there. You know, Cleavon Little, the movie was co-written by Richard Pryor. Right, right. Writing the jokes. Yeah. And I stopped and I looked around the theater and everybody was laughing. I said, everybody's laughing. It's funny, man. Relax. You know, but, but you know, this idea, we can let people, if, if the intent is fair and equitable, people are willing to, I think people are more willing to laugh at their own situations and laugh at themselves and laugh at their ethnicity and their nationalities and their religion and all those things, you know, as long as there's no ill intent in there, as long as there's not some white supremacist going, you know, well, you know what they say, you know, well, without, yeah, without, a, without a smile. That's the magic word right there, intent. I always talk about that too. It's the same thing. Like I think with comedy, the intent is just to make people laugh. And and if they're doing it, if they're making fun of both sides, then I feel like that's fair game. But um, but the the intent for people to, that is not to be uh, uh to make people laugh is just to hurt people. I mean, do you, how do we deal with that? Because I feel like that's that is a big problem in the world today. Like if you go on social media, there's just a lot of like nastiness and and uh, negativity. And I mean, how can we? be more kind to each other. I did this video on kindness. Nobody fucking watched it. Nobody listens to me, but maybe they'll listen to you. Like, do you think that that's something that we can work on as a society right now? Can we work on civil discourse? You know, I mean, look, you know, I, I don't suffer fools easily. Sometimes I go after them. And just for the people say, why do you bother Dave? I said, because it's fun. I consider it a palate cleanser when I'm working on my different projects. Sometimes let's go online and find a troll and just take them down, you know, um, but other times I tell people, this is what the block button is for. This is what the mute button is for. I prefer to mute, by the way, I attack them, then mute. So they're screaming, in, they're screaming in the <laughs> night and nobody's hearing them. Um, so I like Sebastian Bach taught me that one. Uh, but you know, I mean, you know, and, and I just, re I'm not uh, going to allow these people, you know, but I just said, I like to have fun with them, picking on them and stuff. But for the most part, I'm not going to surround with allow these people into my world. If this is the way you're going to behave, you want to talk civilly, you want to disagree with me, you want to go at me, but in a in a in a in, you know, barely and you don't have to be even intelligent, just conversational matter, let's go. I always I always welcome that kind of discussion. But the just, you know, the slander and attack and threaten, you know, block. I got no time for you. And you know what? I mean, I'm look, I'm blessed. I, I, you know, these night are bigger and scarier the closer you get for some reason. And for some reason, people think I'm seven feet tall, even when they're standing next to me. Um, I, you know, so I've never, all, in all my confrontations, no one's ever come up to me on the street and got in my face, ever. Uh, they may have, from down the block, say, oh, that's the Snyder, and started walking toward me. But, but at the end of the day, they never come up and, and go after me. Why is that? Probably because I'm big and scary. Okay, that's not a good excuse. Not everybody's big and scary. Uh, but at the same time, yeah, I think that people need to be kinder to each other. People need to keep things to yourself. You don't have to tell us everything, all your dirty laundry. I mean, it's an old edict. There used to be a saying, never, you know, in a social situation, don't talk about religion, sports, or politics. And that was just accepted. And people hung out and enjoyed those companies. I, and I have friends who I know. I got one friend, close friend. He's a Boston fan. I'm a Yankee fan. I wear a Yankee hat. He wears a Boston hat. I've known him for 25 years. We hang out together. We've never mentioned our hats. Why? That's the end of us. Because Yankee fans and Boston fans do not get along. But if we start going down that road, but why do we have to talk about that? Why do we have to talk about my religion. Why do we talk about my political beliefs? Why can't we just say, look at the Trumps. 
I became friends with the Trump family, the whole family. They were amazing. They were great to hang out with. This was during my three seasons on and off the Celebrity Apprentice. Um, and uh, and then, you know, and when when uh, you know, when Trump started running for, for office, he called me up and said, Hey, I want to use one, I'm gonna take it. As I as my aunt is thing, I'm like, absolutely, my friend, yeah, man, go for it. Within three months, I had called him up. I said, You gotta stop. <laughs> I didn't know that's what you believed in. And I we never talked about it, and we had hung out a lot. But there was no need to talk about that stuff. And I honestly don't believe he sincerely believes a lot of stuff he says. I think whatever sells his product, he's all about finding a more, finding being successful and winning at all costs. Mm-hmm. So if that's the audience that's going to help him win, I don't believe, I know he's not re- super religious. I know these things. I, I know he was a Democrat up to the time he, turned, he signed on to be a Republican because he saw gold in them, Nor Hills. You know, he's that. So, um, but, you know, I said, I said, and you know what he said? Okay. And he stopped using it that night, mm-hmm. you know? And I said, so I said, are we cool? And, uh, you know, and he said, of course we're cool. We've raised money for St. Jude's together. We, we've done so many charity events together. We, he said, you know, we don't agree politically, but of course we're cool. And, uh, but the point being, why do we have to be so in, our fa- in people's faces with our belief system today? Why do we have to wave a damn flag all the time? You know, and uh, and it's not just the right. The left is doing it, too. Just shut the fuck up. <laughs> well, OK, so that, that brings me to my next question. I'm sure you're going to get asked about this a million times if you haven't already. But because, um, you know, the article that came out about how you were supposed to be the grand marshal of the San Francisco Gay Pride Parade. And then it was canceled because uh, you retweeted Paul Stanley's thing about. I mean, I could read the whole tweet, but uh, basically the way I understood it was just maybe slowing things down a little bit with the transgender kids in terms of leading them down that route to either transition as kids or have the surgeries or puberty blockers. And that's what I was kind of taking from it. But you you explained it to me. Well, I'm you know, I'm not it's, it, being that it's Pride Whip Month. I'm not going to open a, a, that gaping wound uh, so much. People are just looking for me to say more. And I said it all. And I. You know, they they, I, they tried to cancel me because I didn't see I 100 percent eye to eye with a community that wanted me to be there the, to be to be the grand marshal of the parade. OK, with a community that I've stood with uh, and fought for for decades. And all of a sudden, one. I, as, as a parent, I disagreed with children's ability to make cognitive decisions at the age of five, six and seven. I have four children, and I have, soon will have any minute, by the way, waiting for my fifth grandchild. And I, I and in my learned opinion, they are not capable. And I and I and uh, and they were like canceled, you know, not just the show, but they went after me, you know, they called me transphobic. So I, I'm a hell of a writer. You read my book, you know my speech in Washington. I just I, rewatched I, that today. Yeah, I broke out the the pen, which is mighty a sword, and I. I posted on Facebook. People, you can go to it's it's Face D Snyder and see what I said. Although it was pretty covered in the in the media, and uh, and I, where's Paul Stanley apologized? I'm not apologizing. Not when I do nothing wrong. I'm the first to apologize when I screw up. But I, you know, and I just laid it out, and they, you know, a couple of little peeps here and there. Meh, 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 D's whining. Yeah, that, you're not canceling me. You're not shutting me up. And it's you know, and the big point was, you know. That community, uh, the LGBTQIA plus community, and what other letters we're adding, um, they need the support of not, of not just the people who agree with them 100%. They need the support of the middle. And that's where most of us are. The people of the middle to accept them and recognize their rights and, and, and you know, and who they are. But that does not mean we have to. And I use the word fealty, you know, say so fealty and that and bow down to every little thing they say. Who agrees with every single detail of what anybody says, you know? So, um, so I just pushed back on it. Um, everybody backed off. They were shocked because most people just apologize or or curl up in a in the fetal position. But I don't know why do people forget. I'm I was a kidding when I wrote. We're not going to take it. I couldn't believe the Washington wives in 85 invited me to Washington. Me? You want me in that room? You wanted Vince Neil in that room. 
You wanted the you wanted that that stuff. He's your action. You wanted that in your room. You you didn't want the guy who wrote. We're not gonna take it. And you know, and the same goes. You're gonna go after. We're not gonna take the guy who wrote. We're not gonna take it. You want, they were gonna use my song too as their battle cry. Why? Because it's that defiant. And I am have lived by my words. There's nothing that's changed with me. I'm not saying I haven't grown and improved. My wife says you're always trying to be better. I am. And I'm a I'm a, a better man, but my basic belief system has never changed, and I still stand and believe in everything I've always stood and believed for. So um, don't come after me. It's a it's a worst person. I'm the worst person to come after after because I'll come back after you. I remember uh, this is a true story. You just have to press turn. Someone said D only has an on switch. Uh, I, remember <laughs> I love this. this is great during the during the heyday. You know, and I lived on the the big the state with the fence and the walls and all that stuff. And some kids climbed over and came onto my property. I got my chainsaw, started up and went running after them. <laughs> this is true. I was on the third. <laughs> people don't believe me. Those people called into the Howard Stern show and said, it's true. It's true. Don't come on my property. That's my property. Okay. I'm outside the gates. I'm out in the streets. I'm the nicest guy in the world. How you doing? Nice to meet you. Yeah, I'm D. You know, if, if I can, I'll take a picture and sign an autograph. But come onto my property. <laughs> Garage door goes up. Running out the oh my climbing back over the wall. Did you I, put on the I, hockey I, mask too? Or I, no, I just had this mask, the face, <laughs> the D face. It's scary enough. Okay, but so, but to get back to that, I mean, so you still support the gay community, you still support 100%. the trans. I am in the middle as well. I I support everybody. You can look at the guests on my show. I've had gay people. I've had, uh, I've had Christian preachers on my show. I've had everybody. How do how do we support everybody? I mean, how I want. I love that you are friends with a Yankee fan. Or wait, sorry, you're the, no, you're the Yankee fan, and he's a Red Sox, Boston fan. Yeah. yeah. So how how can we all as a society? Because I just feel like we're so divided. I mean. Do we need a war? Do we just always need someone to hate? We need to hate somebody else so we could come together? Or how can we come it, it together without to that? Be, to me, it just seems to be acceptance. You know, acceptance of, and you know what? And take the white supremacists, for example. Um, I, do not, uh, I do not accept their belief system. And for the most part, they live where they are surrounded by people who agree with each other. And you go there and live there. And it's just, but don't come into my community and start, you know, causing problems like they did down in Virginia and, you know, and, and attacking people and hitting people with cars. That's of course over. You want to sit there in your own sad little world and hate the world and, and, and hate the fact that guess what? In, in another hundred years, everybody's going to be tan. There's going to be no white people. Everybody's inter intermarrying now. And we're just going to, and you know what? It'll be a better world when everybody's just tan and handsome. It always seems that the mutts are, yeah, that nice, nice brown, tannish color. You know, that, that's going to be a better world when there's a, hey, where's the white guys? Where are the white guys now? We're all just tan now. But, you know, and let people be and let people, as long as they're not interfering with your and enforcing their way belief system upon you and interfering with your life. Let them, you know, accept people. And I do accept people. But so, because that's what it seems like that people are not accepting. And I, it, it goes no, from right no. to the left. I mean, now you've got the, uh, I mean, what are your, what's your take on this? Because now they're, people are boycotting Bud Light. People are boycotting Target. And uh, I mean, it, it just you goes. See that? And, Did you see and then that? they go back and forth and then they call them transphobic. And then it just keeps going back and forth. I'm like, how do we get out of this circle? Did you see the Kid Rock video? Yes. Did you see it slowed down? No. John Oliver pointed it out where he shoots all the Bud Light with the, with the, he's, it's, it's, as he says, it's about 20 yards away. I'm a gun, I, I'm a gun advocate, but I'm very much for intelligent gun control, you know, and I've got too many guns right in these cabinets right behind me. They don't get started with me. But, uh, <laughs> but if you slow it down, first of all, he's spraying all over the place. You see off to the right, I'm like, I don't know, their rockets or something are fired to, to actually hit the target. Go watch it. Slow mm. it down. It was unbelievable. So somebody is off camera hitting the actual, because, because you know, kid looks like he's half in the bag. So kid's half in the bag, spraying his gun all over the place, is, is you know, AR, and somebody is firing a large something at and, and hitting the target for Kid Rock. 
it's pretty funny. But um, but you know, uh, so the question. I'm sorry, I got, I got sidetracked thinking about that. Yeah, no, that's it. I'll have to check that out. But it was, but the question, but the question was just oh, about. You, the, so the do you, I mean, what do you think of these boy? Because I just feel like it just keeps going back and forth. The sides keep daring each other. Oh well, this pisses you off. Okay, so now the Dodgers are having these uh with anti-Catholic uh, trans group coming. I feel like they're just trying to do this to piss people off. Let's look at, just remember, I'm saying to you, I'm saying to people listening, just remember, these, this, these people, the, 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 the loudest people in the room are such a small percentage on the right and on the left. Somebody asked me, they said, what's a moderate? And I said, in, in my on my Facebook post, I said, I drive a Tesla and I have a drive a Hummer. I said, I have too many guns and I'm for intelligent gun control. I said, I have four children and I advocate a women's rights to choose. I said, I'm a motorcycle riding environmentalist. I said, I don't believe any of these things are mutually exclusive, that you can't drive an electric car and a gas guzzler. I don't believe that. And I said, and I, and I know that most of the people out there feel the same way. So you're not extreme left where it's all or nothing over here or extreme right where it's all left over here. And you want to know what a moderate is? Everything in between, all the range in between. Those are moderates. Anybody who is willing to consider compromise, discussion, negotiating, anybody who's willing to have a discussion on a, a subject is a moderate today because the extreme right, the extreme left, there's no room for, look, look what happened to me with the trans community because I disagreed with one aspect, one aspect. Oh, that's it. You're canceled. You can't cancel me. But anyway, and the right, <laughs> and right, look what's going, you know, what's got anything done with the right. And they just, they just vote against anything that makes sense just for that sake of we're not giving an inch. So if you're anywhere between those extremes, if you think that we should actually compromise a little, welcome to the middle, welcome to the moderates, and welcome to the vast majority, the silent majority, because we don't speak, I speak up, but most of the people in that middle don't really say too much. You know, we're just trying to figure it out. Well, yeah, yeah, canceled, just trying to figure it out, just trying to get along, make the best of it. We're just trying to, you know, life is tough enough without taking these positions of, of just extreme positions that make you miserable. These people hang on to these, 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 these beliefs and it, they're just, you're just grimacing all the time. Smile, man. Life is pretty great if you let it, if you let it be. But with you guys around, you're ruining the party. Oh, well said. No, I, I agree 100%. I think, and that's the thing is like, is being kind to each other. Even if, if, you, if you disagree, just try to be kind to that person. It'll make you feel better. Like scientifically, the hormones and the chemicals in your brain will feel better if you try to be nicer. I just wish that we could get that message out to more people. Well, there's, there's so many things in, in play here, man. This is, you know, and um, you're talking to a guy who's thought a lot about it, but we're also dealing with like a human nature. If it doesn't have the answer, always thinks the worst, always fills the blank in with a negative. If we don't know what our neighbor is thinking, we think the worst of them. If somebody doesn't show up for an appointment, we think they're standing us up. We don't think, oh, maybe their car had a flat tire. We, we, we always, for some reason, just imagine like a negative and fill those blanks. Don't always assume that the other person is out to fuck you. I, I mean, it's, that's not really the way it is. It really isn't the way it is. Did you see the Borat sequel? Yeah. Uh, and the the COVID thing where he holds up with those with those two rednecks, mm -hmm. and he's in their house. He's being Borat, and he's living with. They took him in. Uh, my my son, who's definitely more left than right, although all the my left people are starting to come away because the left is too extreme now. They just don't, you know. It's like I, I can't stand with these people because they're a little crazy. But he said that gave him hope. Because if you remember that scene, they were very, you know, rednecky and very right. right. But but they took him in, a stranger, 
and gave him a place to stay. And when he started speaking about women, remember he was very, it was very demonstrative and talking about women like their cattle or something. They actually said, "Hey, man, hey, man, you can't, you can't talk like that. That's not, you can't. That's not." So you know, and, and my son, they pointed out. He said it actually gave me hope. They're not like evil. <laughs> they're not because they're on the right side. The right, they're not evil people. They're not. And neither are the people, people on the left. left. I don't yeah. think either. I don't think. No. I think most people are not evil. Yeah, the character in your book, uh, yes. yeah, that guy's evil. Okay, well, we'll go with that. There are some evil, but I feel like most people are not. And if you just sat down and had a conversation like we're having with most people in this country, I think you'd find more common ground than more differences. And, 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 and you know, yes, there are. And the Jimmy O character in my in Frats is a psychopath. Uh, <laughs> yeah. they, they do exist. They do right. very damaged, very morally and mentally corrupt people that are just they've got no no they, they, they you know they, they they got no goodness in them they do exist but most people you're right if you can sit down but if people could just hold back on getting on the defensive that's another thing we seem like when we do sit down we're poised for the other side to attack we're poised to 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 to, to fight back now, point. We, you know, we, we're already in positioning ourselves for an argument or a debate. You know, I see this within my own family. I've got, you know, siblings, six, there's six of us, and four are, are Trump Trumpers, and they're very not all of them. Two of them are possibly hostile. Can't even have a conversation without them going on the attack and going, "Hey, man, can we just have a, a, a talk?" You know, again, uh, can we uh, acknowledge that maybe? Neither side is completely right or completely wrong. Yeah, you know, they're, and they're that extreme where they just shut down. So you got to, you, you know, people should just be able to sit down, but don't be so defensive. Don't be ready to attack. Just give it a, just give it a damn second. Yeah, no, I, that's, I love, that's great advice. I mean, well, you mentioned that uh, Trump and it's so interesting. You said you hung out with him and he's different than uh, what he portrays. How is he different? What is it like to hang out with Trump? Well, no, I don't think he's that much, he's that much different in that oh, regard. He's just he doesn't. I don't believe his political belief system is uh, this hard right. As you know, he, he look where he comes from. He comes from New York. He was a Democrat. He's, I, I know he's not a churchgoer, and I don't I keep track of it. But I just know, you know. I mean, you know, uh, man, we were shooting on Sundays. If I if memory serves, we were filming celebrity friends on Sundays. You know, and that's his show. No, no devout, no devout Christian shooting on a Sunday. Uh, you know, so, um, uh, you know, it, it just wasn't, there wasn't that antagonistic attitude. If anything, now, he, now he's a bit of a star effer. So, you know, he likes celebrity. Um, but, uh, but anything, it was, it was, it was more of a positive thing, <laughs> you know, about everybody. It was all like, it was more upbeat, uh, in conversation and attitude and vibe. There was no cynicalness. There was no smirk. There was no, but you see, constantly smirking and constantly, you know, looking down, and you know, it was it was more he was more relaxed and conversational and just in the moment, and, you know, not 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 and and his kids were were great. They don't drink, they don't get high, they they they're intelligent, uh, you know. They, I mean, speak with, with me, talk, speaking with them, person to person, everybody was very reasonable and very normal. You know, and there was a, and then on that show, there was such a wide range of characters from the, from the right to the left and everybody got along because prior to Trump, people did not just spew their venom endlessly uh, on both sides, you know, of their belief system, you know? Um, so, you know, it's, it's just, there's ways of getting your point across, there's ways of achieving your goal without getting ugly, without getting nasty, you know, it's going to, Everything's going to take compromise and everything's going to take negotiation. And if you think it's going to be everything you want or everything they want, that's not the way the world works. No, it's definitely not. I feel like you need to go back to Congress and get them to uh, like work together with you. I feel like they're just fighting each other and getting nothing done. Like you should go back and speak about the Give this lecture to them. I went back with Washington with the Grammy uh, committee. They were this was a few years ago. Um, it was called Grammys on the on the Hill, and we we're pushing for um, better royalty rates. And people go, "Oh yeah, well, you rich guys need to be richer." No, it's it's really more about the not the small musician. You know, what I mean, yeah, if we get if 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 the big record sellers get a a bigger piece of the 
royalties or whatever, yeah, they're just getting richer and richer. But for some, for the, for the majority of artists who are smaller artists, um, it's they don't they're barely getting by on on their royalties and stuff. So it's it's a huge difference to them. So we went to fight for everybody, and what a difference a couple of decades, man. I went into the Capitol building. I went into I met with senators. They when I went there in the eighty five. I was had you know when I left came home I had uh, marks all over my body where they were poking me with ten foot poles. I mean I was a scourge of the earth. The senators left and right were running out of their offices to meet me and shake my hand and take a picture. They all knew. I guess they knew. Okay, we're not going to make the same mistake again. Nancy Pelosi, Kevin McCarthy, all of them. Hey, come on in. Come on in. How you doing, Sam? Sit down. So good to see you. Boy, they were treating me so much different, but um. Well, oh. they're, they're not they're complete idiots. They're incomplete idiots. <laughs> that's a good one. That's great. Wow. Well, yeah, I mean, because that's what you, you have to do now. You, you can't get the music royalty, so you do it. That's why you're writing books and movies and acting and doing all this other stuff, right? Well, you know what? Look, this is a, another uh, piece of the puzzle, as my wife likes to say. I want to be rich and famous. I grew up in a lower middle class neighborhood. I was the oldest of six. I was six born in eight years. As soon as I was like, I, you know, I was born. Okay, you're on your own. And we got more kids coming. And, you know, and uh, so, and I, and how was I going to get to be rich and famous? Uh, well, I was good in sports, but not great. But I could sing and I love rock and roll. And uh, yeah, I'm going to be a rock star. I'm going to be a rich, famous rock and roll star. So to me, it was not about just doing it for the love of it. Although, believe me, for many, many years, it was the love was the only thing you had. But it was always, at least you had the dream that I might be able to strike oil. I might be able to get rich doing this. And I was able to, and I did. The poor musicians today, I go to see so many of these young bands, they do it purely out of love, and they have no uh, hope of getting rich from it. They're just hoping to sell enough TV T-shirts to get to the next town. So it, it it breaks my heart to see that. And I, but I come from a place where, yeah, this was a career choice and I took a big chance on it. You know, I put all my eggs in one basket and if it failed, I would have been shit out of luck, you know? Uh, so, I mean, but, but at least, like I said, it was, I was, had a goal that I could actually be successful in this business. So I don't really want to. Once you've you've had your records on the radio, you've had your videos on MTV, you've you've so, sold millions of records. Your your songs are appreciated and respected. It it's very hard to just write for yourself again, unless at least for me. So now when I'm writing a book, I'm not expecting to be a bestseller. I am doing it purely out of the love. I write screenplays, and, but there's always the hope that one of these things could. You know, maybe somebody will buy it, pick up the book for a movie, or maybe it'll actually start selling a lot of copies. You, you always want the hope that the effort that you're putting in could pay off. In the music business, that's gone. Yeah, well, so you say you wanted to be rich and famous. So, I mean, why why the famous part, though? Because the rich, I mean, you could have been rich by being a stockbroker or being like a band Attention. manager. Attention. Um, there's a, there's a um, graphic novel coming out next month. Well, he's not going to take it on Z2 Comics. And they, it, um, and graphic novels, those are not comic books, but they're more adult aimed and a little more serious in their content, less about superheroes, although I am pretty heroic. Uh, but um, it's, and they wanted to know uh, why you, D, how did you become, how did that moment in time line up with your trajectory where you became the voice? that spoke out and to this day is resonates, you know? And so they go back to my, to me being born, literally opening my eyes for the first time in the crib. And I was the oldest, the first born in all the families. So all the siblings, my father and all the siblings, my mother had no children. I was born. So I was Simba, you know, this circle, they held me up and everybody just, bow down before the great and powerful D, the baby D. And then, as it is with, if you, I don't know if you have kids, but it seems like everybody starts getting married at one time, all your friends. Your friends all start having kids. Well, 
all my mother and father's siblings started having babies like it was a competition. <laughs> and I told you within, my mom had six kids within eight years. And I went from being like the only child, the golden child, to being sort of like, okay, next. And like, take care of yourself. Here's your sister and your cousins. And they're all here. And, they, and in the comic book, it's pretty funny because you see just me with all the aunts and uncles and the grandparents. And then slowly I'm being pushed to the back and there's this mob of children and I'm just like in the back like trying to get attention and that's why I wanted to be famous I wanted attention for a moment for a brief moment I had all the attention in the world I was the golden child I wanted to be the golden child again I had to be famous do you think that's a problem in society today though that too many people want to be famous because with social media like I feel like everyone's an Instagram model or a TikTok star or like you said that the younger bands are doing it for the love of the music like I question if some of them are doing it just to be famous and to get recognition, which if it's recognition for, you know, their art, I think that's okay. But a lot of it, I mean, a lot of people are just seeking fame to be fame. Well, these bands that I'm going to seeing at these, at these metal shows, my kids are all metal heads. Um, you know, they're not celebrities. They're not rich. And, uh, but I'll see passionate, a few thousand passionate bands singing every word, every word. And, and the bands just, putting everything they've got, like college football players, they may be, not be a professional, you know, college, they said they put more into it because they don't know if they're going to make it. You know, they've given everything they got. That's what the bands are doing. So I, I, I know for a fact, these bands are, aren't getting real fame, maybe a notoriety within their group of people, but they're not getting that international acclaim that, that I was afforded in, in, during my time. So I, I don't really see that with them. Um, but yeah, people want to be famous for doing nothing. And that's what scares me. I mean, when you talk about, yeah. you, you mentioned the mass shootings. I feel like that's a piece of that too, where some kids just like, I just want people to know who I am and this is a way to do it. Yeah, infamous or, or famous, but you know, for doing nothing or exposing themselves or, um, you know, acting out on on, on social media, uh, you know, the sort of the jackass framework of, of you know, of what can I do that will get me, uh, will get me more uh, hits and more, more likes. You know, the like the whole like machine. Um, yeah, that's a sad reality. You know, and I've got grandkids who are, you know, uh, are YouTubers. And what are you doing? They're playing video games. And there are people who just play video games. And they've got millions of followers. And they play videos. They're entertaining in their banter, I guess. And I guess that's one of the reasons, or they're good at the game. But um, it doesn't seem like a really good reason it doesn't seem like a real achievement or a craft or something. And by the way, anybody out there who's watching this and sort of snickering going, hey, welcome back to Earth. Guess what? AI is coming for you. Just like our jobs have been taken away, your job's being taken away. I said, And then guess what? So you're going to see exactly what it feels like when nobody wants to pay you for what you do anymore because they can get it for free. So uh, have fun. Yeah, no, that's exactly right. It scares the shit out of me because I think it's it's coming for so many jobs. What are we going to have left to do as humans? I don't know. It's kind of it's going to be the manual labor. AI. Well, you got some ro robots and stuff and stuff, but uh, the jobs that will be left, are, you know, landscapers and gardeners and you know, garbage collectors. You know, <laughs> yeah, manual labor, the good stuff, the good stuff. Oh, God, I always said, I always said, you know, when I, I, I always, always said, you think your job's important. You know, you think you're you are important. Uh, put it next to a garbage man. <laughs> what happens yeah. if you stop doing your job? And I'll and I'm, I say, designer, I stop doing my job. People don't get a concert. They don't get a song. They're not entertained. What happens? The garbage man stops collecting. Pestilence. Right. No, it my dad. Is, my dad used to say something similar. Like my brother would be like, "I worked really hard." He's like. You worked in an air conditioned office. My gardener. Now he works hard. He's out there. Exactly. Hey, when we've had, we've had, you know, if any city that's had a garbage collection strike, you know how fast the rats grow and how fast the disease and it becomes ugly quick. So you want to know what's important? Garbage men are important. Get the garbage the hell out of my front yard. Yeah. And truck drivers. But I think what you do too is like, I mean, besides just entertaining, I think you inspire people. And I think that's, definitely something that's kind of lacking right now. That's why, I mean, it's nice to have this conversation with you because maybe people will get inspired from that. 
I hope so. I mean, I, I mean, you know, and if and if I do that for people, um, you know, I'm, I'm, I will continue to do that for people because I think people do need to be reminded. They do need, do need to be lifted up. They do need to be told that their voice matters. And it doesn't have to be screaming at the other guy. It just has to be vote. Get out there and, and just do the things that really make a difference. And do not allow people to walk on you, control you, dictate to you, because that's what they want to do. With all this gerrymandering that's going on, they are trying to control the board. They want to control the board. They want to control us. And 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 even, you know, the media. You know, the media is feeding the fires on the left and right. We got we got radio stations and 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 television stations that are are just are just just making the argument worse. They're not looking to calm it. They're looking to to, to get the flames roaring because that's good ratings for them. That's what gets people watching. That's what gets people paying attention. You know. Yeah. No, I thought that was interesting. I heard you talking about how you. Uh... You turned down an offer from a pharmaceutical company that they wanted to use you and your song for some sort of like pain medication. And you said, no, I don't I don't want to do even though it was a lot of money. I was like, wow, that's pretty ballsy that you would turn them down. I well, you know, I'll be honest. I'm not going to be a liar. You know, I, I took a look and I tried tried to find my vaginal dryness, which was how I justified <laughs> that women's premenopausal pain medication that Twisted Sister used their song on many years ago. And they started telling me what it did. I said, oh, my God, women's premenopause. Come on, man. What happened to the band? What does it do? Hey, uh, wait a minute. Stops vaginal dryness? I'm against that. Okay. I'll t- <laughs> I, they can use my song. Yeah. I'm fighting vaginal dryness. You can rationalize that one. Yeah. I, you know, so I, I'm not going to lie to you. You know, I, I wanted to take the deal. I was looking at it and, you know, turning it around and going against it. Man, at the end of the day, it was a damn opioid. And it was, that was opioid. I can't do, couldn't do that. But I did try to find some justification, you know, uh, find your vaginal dryness and run with it. But, you know, so it wasn't that black and white, like, no, D. Snyder takes a stance. I'm not going to lie to you. I'm human. I'm not, I'm human. I'm not, you know, 47 years with the same woman. I'm human. I've dealt with the same things that, that, that all couples have dealt with all, you know, it hasn't been wedding bliss. We've been to, we've been to, you know, you know, I mean, we are marital bliss, I should say. We are super close and it's unbelievable, but we've been to counseling three times, you know, over the 47 years and we nearly broke up at one point. I wrote about it in my book. You know, it's a, it's a, it's no secret because we're humans, you know, stuff happens, but you just got to try to be the best human you can, people. Just try to be a little better human. Don't give into your, you know, the, your, your, your darker side. Yeah, no, 47 years. That's, that's amazing. Especially in the entertainment business. That's very rare. It is rare. And it is, you know, and, um, and, but you know, I don't, I, I wave it not as a flag of like, look at me, I'm 47 years. No, it's just like, I can't believe it. We're still here, you know, cause it's tough, right? It's tough stuff happens, you know, and, and it, the only constant is change. You know, that's what my father said to me and it's true. You know, it, it's not a set it and forget it scenario. I remember when my, my wife's brother was murdered and in the streets of New York. I mean, what she went through, the depression and stuff like that, that, that was a test, you know, a test for a relationship. You know, it's, you know, she was going through an incredibly hard time. But that's when you say, well, this is, you know, for better, for worse. This is the worst part. You stick it out. You hang in there. You know, she's going through hell, you know, and, you know, and you're, you're getting, the, you're receiving a lot of it because it's such a nightmare. But um, but this is, you know, you just got to keep working at it. And that's the game. That is the game. Keep working at it. Yeah, I've heard that from a lot of people who have successful marriages. Like there's a lot of stories like that where there was bad times and they just stuck with it. And now they're happier for it. Well, the the revelation of the first time we went to a marriage counseling was um, the counselor said, what do you think the difference between couples that get divorced and couples that stay together is? So my wife and I you know, went down, uh, infidelity, uh, finances, uh, you go down the list. He goes, no, the problems are all the same. So the couples that stay together won't accept divorce as an option. Once you take that off the table, all you're left with is figuring it out. And that was like, whoa, you know, so are we going to be the ones who say, let's, we're divorced, you know, or are we going to be the ones who say, we ain't doing that. We got kids, we got a family, we got responsibilities. So let's figure it out. You know, and that's and and that was and so 
any married people out there listening, that's a huge thing to know. And and what are you and what are you trading for, men and women? You know, the devil you know versus the devil you don't know. You know what I mean? You think it's going to be that much better? You think it's going to be that much better? You know, we're all idiots. You know, we're just trying to figure it out. You're just trying to yeah. figure it out. You know, so you, you got one that's you know that's pretty workable. Stick with them. Try to be workable. <laughs> okay, that's one thing. You know, try to negotiate a little. Just back to negotiating. Try to compromise. Try to change. Try to try to work on it. If both sides, you know, as long as you got that going for you, you'll make it. Good advice. Good stuff. Well, the book is out now. And then you have some uh, movie stuff coming out too, like Cal- Calicoon. Is that the movie you, you have coming out? I can't believe that it's on there. I don't know where that came from. Calicoon is on my IMDb page. Yeah. I don't know where that's from. Um, if it ever was a discussion, it's like 20 something years ago. And really? I, I mean, Man. I don't even, I, and, and I don't even know what that is. So, no, I mean, but to me, like, are you going to hear more music from Dee Snyder? Not outside of a movie or I've got a, a, a an animated show that I co-created called Monsters Rock. It's over at Peacock right now being developed. Mm. I'm writing music for that. Outside of that stuff, no, you won't. Um, you know. Uh, I, Not I another uh, c- cameo in uh, Cobra Kai? <laughs> no, but I am. I did uh, get offered a role in a new um, Ben Affleck, uh, Adam Sandler movie, uh, which is pretty cool. Oh. Um, yeah, yeah, not playing a rock star, not playing, doing a cameo. Uh, actually, an acting role, which is really cool. It's been pushed back, obviously, because there's a little striking going on now. Oh, but right, uh, right. And I'm going to be directing a movie I wrote called My Enemy's Enemy. Again, once things calm down with the strike, and now the now we have a looming Screen Actors Guild uh, strike. The Screen Actors Guild members, which I'm a member, have voted to strike. 97% voted if we don't, if our negotiations don't go well. So, and... Uh, and so we were already on the picket lines with the the Writers Guild. So um, anyway, so that's pushed back that stuff. And I've got well, I've got my uh, Funko Pop coming out any day. It's it's already uh, yes, yeah, so that's pretty cool. The D Snyder Funko Pop. Look for that in stores soon. We've got the uh, the graphic novel. What else is happening? I know I'm missing so many things, but well, directing, writing, acting. That's enough, isn't it? That's a lot. You're a busy man. <laughs> well, people can follow you on social media to keep up and. Yeah. Uh... I'll put your website in the show notes. And then I always end with it promoting a charity. I think last time we talked about uh, you promote a charity for homeless veterans and also Melissa's wish. Those two. Melissa's wish. Mm-hmm. Um, yeah. I'm still uh, championing. Well, yeah, the homeless veterans, I, we, when we did a celebrity um, family feud, it was homeless veterans. And I, we wound up winning like 25 grand for them, which was cool because I mean, the homeless situations just, unconscious no it is it's it's just in, in, insane but the idea that there are vets who are homeless is just unconscionable that's unconscionable i mean people have served our country that they should be on the streets it's just i just I don't understand and and many of them are because they've got issues you know that is that because you talk about that there's a homeless vet in your in your book is that part is that part of the book true um, no, but it's based on, okay. you know, that's based on that they, they're out there on the street. The, the story that happens with that homeless guy. Yeah, I don't want to give it away, but yeah. It's true. Okay. That's true. Okay. A uh, horrible truth. Yeah. Uh, but the, I just decided to put a little, the fact that he was a homeless vet just to, it doesn't need to be richer uh, that <laughs> this person was murdered. And I'm like, and that's not giving me too much how it yeah. happened. The interesting part. But, uh, but, you know, it doesn't need to be richer, but just, the plight of the homeless veterans just uh, sure. just just hangs over there. So um yeah so I uh, check out the book. I can write. He can tell you. And um I've been writing for God, forty years now. Screenplays and stage plays and articles. So I've gotten really good at the craft. This is my third book, and um it's something I I love. And and what I love about it is I can be anybody, any age, any color, as long as what the words on the page resonate with the reader. It doesn't matter. That of 68 year old former rock star, white guy, grandpa. You know, it doesn't matter. It's just that it's the it's what's on the page. It's the art. If the art resonates with the people, it doesn't matter who painted it. You know, it doesn't matter. And I'd really like to get out of the spotlight aspect of things and be a little more behind the scenes. Although I doubt that's ever going to happen because I'm too damn outspoken. Yeah, you are. No, so would, would frats? Would you ever turn that into a screenplay in a movie? I would only um it, it's 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 perfect. It's it's so much like the outsiders or the wanderers, if people know those movies, which are based on books. Um, 
And, you know, it's that gang thing with set in 70s suburbia. Um, it's perfect for that, but I'd like to see someone else want to do it. Uh, you know, I've written the book. If a, if a movie studio wants to make it into a movie, you know, I, I welcome that opportunity. Okay, cool. Well, thanks so much for doing this. I'll let you get to the next one, and uh, we'll talk again, I'm sure. Pleasure, yeah, yeah. And uh, so keep your eyes open for all the things I told you about. Absolutely. And, thanks uh, so much, Steve. He's not going to take it next month on Z2 Comics. I can't wait. All right, yeah. see you later. Take care, bye. Bye-bye. Well, there you have it. Uh, a lot to think about from Dee Snyder. The new book, Frats, is out in November. You can pre-order it now on Amazon. Make sure to follow D on social media to keep up with all his latest projects. Sounds like he's a very busy man. You can support both D and the show by liking and sharing this episode on social media. And make sure to subscribe to the show wherever you listen to keep up with future episodes. I appreciate all your support. Have a great rest of your day and shoot for the moon.